Well, the check marks have flickered and the live sign is on. And so awesome. I think I think that uh, things are starting to come to life here um, and people are starting to starting to pile in. Um, and, it, you know, we're all very lucky, actually, because we caught John just before he was about to fly away <laughs> to an international destination to go give, give a speak at a national sales meeting. So um, I'm going to I'm going to run the introduction and we're going to get underway. Awesome. I'm David C. Barnett and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things. I talk to interesting people and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe and let's get to it. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm really happy today to have John Jantz join me from Duct Tape Mar Marketing. How are you today? I'm great, David. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, it was interesting because before, you know, we had a little chat a couple of weeks ago where we talked about doing this, uh, doing this live stream. Uh, and then today, earlier, I went and uh, looked up your LinkedIn profile just to refresh my memory over some of the things that we had talked about. And you, duct tape marketing dates back to 1986. Is that correct or is that a typo? <laughs> no, that's absolutely correct. I, I will say that um, my business dates back to 1986. I don't think I actually adopted the name duct tape marketing until around 2000. Um, it was originally called um, the Clever... Uh, Jance Communications. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I really was trying to create a brand and realized that nobody really cared about, you know, my name, um, I changed it to duct tape marketing. And, you know, we could talk about why and what that means and whatnot. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's how long I've been doing this entrepreneurial thing. Well, so so this gives you a, a tremendous amount of credibility because uh, you know you actually did marketing before the internet. I, you know, I say that sometimes. I stand on stages and say that, and you can see thirty year olds going, "What?" And I don't get it. Like, what? <laughs> so, well, what, why don't we get into that? Like, how how were you helping businesses? be like back then in the beginning yeah. and maybe how has it evolved well certainly the 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 biggest thing that two two major major changes in my view obviously we can all cite the platform changes uh, sure. you know the internet <laughs> for example um you know those those are changes but but fundamentally they haven't changed what we're about you know as marketers but i think the other real big change that not enough people talk about is the way people buy <laughs> and can choose to buy now. That's probably the thing that's changed the most. I mean, a lot of ways, you know, they just needed to find us or we needed to find them and we needed to like explain, here's what you need and here's what it costs. And that was, you know, that's where they got their information. Uh, but but certainly now the the control or the information gathering has shifted dramatically to uh, to the buyer. Yeah, and, and, and I can only imagine, you know, even back when I started my career initially in sales in the 90s, um, you know, it was a lot of education. Like you would talk to someone and they just didn't know anything about what it is you were right. trying, to, trying to sell them. Yeah. And nowadays people, if they want to, they've got access, like there's no more barrier to information. You can just type anything you want into the computer and you can learn what you need to know. Someone who's interested in hot tubs can learn as much as any salesperson is ever going to know before they even take step foot into a place where they might buy one. Yeah, in fact, it's it's really changed the art of selling, right? Because you know, before you're right, we had to have a very set process to educate them on the benefits and the features and what it meant to them. Now, if we're in that mode, there's a good chance they know more about the product than you know than that you know typical salesperson that just started the job. So now, uh, certainly, we have to. Um, we have to be more of a guide. Uh, we mm -hmm. have to build trust. Um, we have to, you know, really show them a, a tremendous experience <laughs> once they get there. Because you know, a lot of times what people have done is they've gone out and done their research, and maybe they've decided on two or three people they're going to talk to now. We don't even know they're looking at us, <laughs> but now they're going to call us up and, and talk to us. And so, th at that point, uh, the the marketing shifts to really creating a great experience, having a great process, you know, is is equally as important. Yeah. Well, you use that P word, that the word process. And, and <clears throat> this is one of the big reasons why 
I wanted to invite you to come on today because, you know, there's a lot of people out there who execute a certain skill, you know, dentists who do dentistry and, you know, marketers who, who help small businesses with marketing, you know, marketing consultants. But one of the things that you've done at Duct Tape Marketing is you've been able to take the work that you do and create some frameworks and processes right. that you are now able to use to train and teach other marketing consultants. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that evolution? Yeah, it actually started as a way to solve a frustration I had. Um, I, you know, I started my business after working for an ad agency. I'd kind of seen the traditional way it was done. I uh, thought any dummy can run a business and <laughs> jumped in, you know, without any real plan. And I hustled work like a lot of people do. You know, I got, I had big clients, little clients, big projects, little projects. And I, I really found that the most enjoyable work for me was, was with that small to mid-sized business, but it was also terribly frustrating. I mean, they had as big a needs as big companies, but certainly no budget and a lot of times no attention span you know, to, mm -hmm. to even get the work done. So I, I literally just said, look, if I'm going to work with small business, I've got to be able to walk in and say, look, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. Here's the results we hope to get. And here's what it costs. Do you want it or not? And sort of to my surprise, like the first three people said, where have you been all my life? <laughs> you know, that every marketers are just talking about all this crazy stuff and I never know what it's going to cost and I don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and so really to try to solve my frustration, I tapped into what is still today and maybe increasingly <laughs> one of the greatest frustrations with, with small to mid-sized businesses. It's hard to buy marketing services the way most people sell them. You know, most people say, what do you need? Sure, we could do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's websites, it's SEO, it's content, it's, you know, it's the idea of the week. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that the fact that somebody walked in and said, look, we're going to install a marketing system. It's going to start with strategy before we ever talk about tactics was just music to their ears. And so I really built uh, a full practice. I was just a guy in Kansas City, um, you know, hustling work. And I built a full practice with that methodology and really decided that, you know, rather than building a giant organization myself, I wanted to take that, you know, that was kind of the dawn of, you know, online people would put a credit card in, into uh, the internet and buy things. And so I started writing about it and, and actually even sold a course uh, in 2002. Um, you know, it was very popular to do the, these days. It was, it was a lot harder to do uh, back then. I was still actually shipping a three ring binder with CDs. Um, if we want to get into a nostalgia <laughs> world, but, uh, um, and that's really in a lot of ways, I don't know that I said to myself and the next phase is I'm going to you know, license this. Uh, but I started having uh, marketing consultants, agencies contact me and say, Hey, I believe what you're doing too. You know, I want to work with small business too. Why don't I just, you know, why don't I just license that? You train me. And so it, you know, as I said, I, I kind of had that in the back of my mind, but, but certainly as people started suggesting I should do it now, you know, that felt like the time to do it. So, you know, for about the last 15 years now, we have licensed this system to, you know, several hundred agencies, consultants, fractional CMOs, uh, you name it. Uh, we've, we've got people here piling in from all over. We've got Kevin, who's uh, joining us from Central Florida. Hey, Kevin, how are you today? And uh, Billy is over in Seattle, Washington, says hello. Good to see you guys. And any, any questions and things that people put into the comments, we will address as we go through the conversation here. Um, so let's, let's talk about this licensing thing, because sure. oftentimes when people have a great business idea, one of the things that people around them might say is, oh, you have a great business idea. Maybe you should be franchising this, right, right. you know, all that kind of thing. And, you know, in my own past, uh, one of the first businesses that I, I got into was a, a junk removal business. And uh, there's some franchises in that sure. space. And people had said to me, well, why don't you do that too? And just the, the obstacles that exist to go out and create a franchise, I mean, it very is, it, it very much is a big business kind of endeavor just because of all the regulatory, legal, right. and, and, and other requirements that have been layered on over time through, through regulation. Yeah, I, I mean, if you can make it work, I mean, you we can all name dozens of franchises that, you know, are big businesses that I'm guessing the founders of those franchises um, have have made lots of money either by being acquired or by you know growing the franchise. But but you're absolutely right. I mean, I looked at it because it was like, well, what should I do? What is the right path? And, you know, it, at that time, which is you know, 20 years ago, it was a six figure legal bill, you know, before you even started, uh, you know, really getting serious. And so. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, uh, the, uh, every state 
attorneys general as you know as as you know had cases where people have been burned and you know over the years franchise it when it first got started it was you know it was kind of scammy in a lot of a uh, lot of ways and so there's tons and tons of regulations on that model um and so uh, there's nothing wrong with the model i just didn't want to go that route um and so you know essentially i wanted to train and, and license and um not really get uh you know license my ip and not really get into managing somebody else's business and, and so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the difference between somebody who wants to be a licensee of your duct tape uh, marketing system. Is it, if I came up and I said, "Hey, I want to work with small businesses. I like what you've done. I don't want to right. reinvent the wheel." And maybe I'd like some of the PR and efforts that you've done over the course of sure. time to kind of rub off on me because people might recognize that name. Right. What what would I be doing? I'd be paying you a fee to then be able to to walk away with that information. Yeah, I mean the the I I. <laughs> You know, obviously, if you get into a legal battle, you know, it's splitting hairs probably on what's the difference between licensing and franchising. But the the, the most significant difference is that I'm not going to tell you how to run your business. I'm not going to tell you how to price your business. I'm not going to take any royalties, you know, from your your efforts. I'm essentially going to train you and mm -hmm. then for an ongoing fee, allow you to use our tools and processes, uh, frankly, any way you see fit, you know, as long as you're not claiming they're yours and, and, you know, doing some, some things against our brand standards. Uh, but you know, that's, that's kind of where it ends. And, and what, what we have also created is um, in addition to people licensing, we also have a network um, almost like a community of, of folks that also enjoy hanging out together and uh, collaborating and, uh, you know, doing additional training and live events and, you know, things of that nature as well. So, you know, step one, part one is is actually licensing will train and let you use our proprietary tools and methodology. Uh, but then if we, we also, you know, have a couple of hundred folks that, uh, that belong to a, you know, a network and kind of meet on a regular basis. And can you get into the evolution of that? Because the community aspect probably wasn't part of the initial uh, things that you were thinking of when you thought about the value proposition yeah. of what you were doing. No, it, it, it really wasn't. Um, it it kind of came because people wanted it. <laughs> you know, I mean, we because we would do training, uh, we would do initially, you know, back when people used to get together in rooms, um, we would do certification training in groups, and people really bonded in those, you know, three, four day trainings, um, and, and wanted to stay connected. And so in a lot of ways, it, it just kind of evolved out of the fact that people are like, hey, we're all kind of like-minded you know we all believe the same things about small business and how to serve them we obviously we've been attracted um so how can we keep how how can we keep this going um and so it evolved as as community but it also you, you know another huge element of it is um you know as people started using our tools and systems and and you know a lot of our model is about you know, you can orchestrate it and then you, you know, you use partners and you use, you know, freelancers and you use third party vendors. And so we actually started building that uh, ecosystem as well um, of, of partners, you know, for web design and content and SEO and paid. Um, and so, you know, that that was another reason that that people, you know, wanted to stay connected as a community because those partners became a really uh, valuable tool for them not just vetted, but, but all kind of used to using in our system and our way of uh, approaching small business marketing. And, and you said, so it's, it's consultants who want to work with businesses, but you said there were also some, some fractional CMOs as well as companies themselves licensing your material directly. Yeah. No, I don't think we have today any companies per se okay. that, you know, like a manufacturer or a plumber or something like that. Um, but uh, I would, our, our group is made up of people that call themselves consultants, people that call themselves agencies, people that call themselves strategists, uh, fractional CMOs. I mean, they're, I guess in some ways it's semantics uh, because in a lot of ways they're doing the same thing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, some people just identify as more of a strategist. Some people identify mm -hmm. more as an agency. Um, but uh, and increasingly that term fractional CMO um, is, is really a lot of consultants are adopting <laughs> that that term because it's you know, 10 years ago, 15 years, I've, I felt like what we've always done has been a fractional CMO approach, but small business owners, that was, you know, didn't make any sense to them. All of a sudden, now you see a lot of people, the whole fractional C-suite has become yeah. a very, very popular thing for accounting, for operations even. And so um, I think that, that we've, we've started to use that term uh, more often because of it, it really does 
um, connotate, you know, a strategic approach, you know, before tactics. Yeah. But, you know, actually, I, you know, we just got a question put up here on the screen. I think we've just addressed this. Can this be licensed to a small business owner? And, and what, what you're saying is that really it's, it's, you don't have any right now, but could a small business owner themselves do this? Well, certainly, certainly we could license it to, uh, to them. The, 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 the biggest significant uh, value and of course, tied to that is the investment <laughs> um, of this is that you can resell it and make money. I mean, our, you know, the right. folks that use our system and work with 20, 30 clients, you know, they're, they're building million dollar businesses on the backs of using these and, and charging money for it. Right. Um, we actually work with, a, you know, we also have an agency. We work with a lot of small businesses and we, it, they wouldn't necessarily license it, but they certainly use it. <laughs> and we right. do a lot of teaching of, you know, uh, and, and even in some cases, uh, coaching of say their marketing managers, uh, you know, on how to, how to actually best employ what we do. So they wouldn't necessarily license it, but, uh, you know, as part of working with us, we can teach them how to, how to do this on an ongoing basis in their own business. Yeah, the uh, uh, back in uh, twenty, I got I got flack from a viewer once because I don't do this enough. Uh, back in <laughs> back in twenty fifteen, I wrote this book called Franchise Warnings, and I drew the distinction between, for example, KFC, which was franchising right. you know their chicken restaurants, sure. versus a company like Broster Chicken, which sells the equipment, yeah, but doesn't tell you how to run a business. They, right, they right, right. you know, this is how you make great chicken. Here's the tool to do it. You go do it on your own. And it's interesting because I've run across broster equipment in some really unusual places, including like big hotels yeah. that in their, you know, in their kitchen of the hotel have broster equipment, but they don't have the name anywhere. I mean, they don't yeah. call themselves a fried chicken really? place, but they, they make it take advantage of that equipment to make really great fried chicken. Right. And so basically what you're saying is if someone wants to get into the business of helping small businesses with their marketing problems, you can provide them basically with that, that, that cooking machine, you can provide them with the, the, That's right. the machinery they need to be able to go out competently work with people. Let, let's talk about some of the challenges that the small business people face. What, what's the most common problem that you or your licensees are going to be helping people with? Out there? Well, I think the biggest one is just not, not enough people in the world of marketing are talking about marketing strategy. <laughs> and so, you know, everybody comes and says, you need to do TikTok or you need to run Facebook ads. And, uh, you know, they- yeah, or they just read that, you know, somewhere. And so they're chasing down the rabbit hole the next thing and, you know, can't really tell if anything's working or not working. They haven't clarified any kind of messaging that would make people, you know, really want to choose them as opposed to somebody else. And so, you know, the first thing we do, I mean, in fact, <clears throat> our methodology is if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I need a website and some SEO, we'll say, yes, you do. Uh, but <laughs> we're going to start with a process we call strategy first. We've, we've essentially productized um, the application or the creation of, of a strategic marketing plan for a small business owner. And it has a very set uh, deliverable, has a very set process, has a set price. Um, and, and what we find that it does is, is it immediately um, allows us to attract investors, <laughs> you know, people who think of their marketing as an investment rather than, oh, I just need this new right. tactic. It also allows us to uh, to help people understand that marketing is not an event. It is it never ends. <laughs> it is a long term you know part of uh, your business, um, and it really allows us to deliver over time, over the long haul, the the you know the the greatest uh, return on their investment because we're doing the right things in the right order. Yeah, um, Kareem sends greetings from uh, New York City. Good afternoon, Kareem. Good to see you there. You know, um, you know it's interesting because I, I took a, uh, you know, in looking at some of the material you have online for duct tape marketing, one of the the terms I saw on there was referring to customer journeys. Yes. And and uh, back earlier in my career, I had a sales position with the Yellow Pages back before Google, you know, sort of dominated right. search. And this was one of the things that was drilled into us in our training at Yellow Pages was understanding the life cycle of, a, of an individual consumer in a town or a city and understanding, you know, what happens in their life to make them reach for that book, right? That's right. What, what are the events that occur that create these needs that say, oh, now I really need a blank, whatever that service is. When they reach for the book, you know, that person already knows that they need a certain product or service. So the marketing messages inside the book had to be tailored to addressing the need rather than 
trying to generate demand, what you might do on a billboard or yeah, yeah. a news, newspaper ad or the radio or something like that, right? Yeah. And so they spent a lot of time teaching us this stuff. And when I when I talk with people and they're like, oh, you should be doing more shorts. And I, and I immediately think back to that customer journey training and I think to myself, well, who am I trying to attract? What is their need? What are they looking for? And how would you know a 30 second little video make it easier for them to find me. And so it gives me a framework for understanding whether or not some fatty new thing is really even applicable. Yeah. yeah. What, how, can you talk a little bit about customer journey and how yeah. you work through that so, with people? So we have used a, a framework that I call the marketing hourglass for about 15 years now. And it was really my acknowledgement that, you know, the buyer is now in much more control and that their journey has a lot of steps and a lot of stages that are, maybe out of our control to some extent, um, or at least the way they go through them. Um, and so we have to actually be thinking holistically about how do we guide people through those stages. And I actually call them behaviors uh, that I think people really want to go through with the companies they do business with. And our, our seven behaviors are no like trust, try, buy, repeat, and refer. Um, mm -hmm. And I use the hourglass shape metaphor because, you know, everybody's familiar with the funnel and a lot for a lot of people, it was just, Hey, yeah, I just want to get that click. I want to get the phone call. You know, then I'm like job done, right. Of marketing. Um, and, and my contention is that no, the real opportunity starts there. <laughs> the, the experience, the retention, the repeat business, and certainly turning people into champions who are then going to be your lead generators. You know, that's where to me, marketing actually gets really exciting. And a lot of people, ignore that completely. And so we can we can actually make a lot of impact with businesses looking at that, you know, back half of the hourglass and making some improvements that can significantly drop to the bottom line with frankly out without spending any more money. Um, and so, you know, that's that's really our, you know, the way we look at it. we use that framework to really and a lot of times to start off when we're working with strategy with somebody to just say like, where are the gaps? Um, you know, you talked about the 30 second shorts. You know, for a lot of people, you've got to get on the radar first. They're, you know, they're not going to download an ebook or listen to an hour show because they don't know anything about you or, you know, any have any trust established. But but if you get out there and get their attention to some extent, um, and you maybe even um, you, you maybe even define the problem they didn't know they had, you know, mm -hmm. now they're going to start saying, wait a minute, I'm going to check this person out. Do I like what I'm seeing? Do other people buy from them? Do, can I trust them? Is there a way to try what it might be like to work with them? And so, you know, taking that kind of end to end customer journey, um, throughout departments, you know, in a, in an organization is, is to me is one of the, um, the best ways to, to build uh, a not only a long term sustainable brand, but also one people are willing to pay a premium uh, to do business with. Oh, interesting. The, the one, one of the things that, that I've often uh, felt when I hear people talking about things online, the online marketing, you mentioned funnel, right? So yeah, right. you've know, you got these people out there talking about my marketing funnel and this is what's happening and blah, 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 explaining their business. And then I often think that the conversations happening on the internet are often very much framed around people who are trying to do business and selling on the internet. Right. And then it becomes a very echo chambery kind of conversation when people come from the outside and then start to sit ringside observing that conversation, they can oftentimes get pulled into things that may or may not necessarily be very applicable to the business that they're coming in from. That's right. What, 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 could you expand upon that? Yeah. I mean, first off, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea of a funnel. There, there is a large universe of people out there that don't know about you, getting mm -hmm. some percentage of them to know about you and then a, a, another percentage of them to feel like, yeah, you've actually got the answer for me. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I think you're absolutely right. You know, we see a lot of people that are selling that as a tactic, as the as the silver bullet, you know, kind of tactic, you're just one funnel away from, you know, being a millionaire. <clears throat> and, and I think so, I saw that headline too. Yeah, it's, it's definitely out there. Yeah. <laughs> I did not just make that up. Um, <laughs> and, and what happens is, you know, they look at how they're doing it. And, and so often, um, many of them just say, oh, okay, I need to be running all these ads and I need to send them to a, you know, a video letter that sells, tries to sell them a $10 thing that tries to sell them this thing that they don't need that tries to upsell them this. Thing. Well, the problem is, you know, I sell a $60,000 service. 
um, you know, over the course of a year, a small business is probably going to pay us 60 to a hundred thousand dollars a year. And, you know, by following that, you know, tripwire $10 thing, you know, all I'm doing is turning away the people that are actually going to be serious. I'm just right. attracting people that want to pay that think they're going to pay $10 for an answer, you know, to, to all their, you know, their needs. So particularly if you're selling a high ticket uh, item, what you really need to do is spend all of your time on building trust and showing how you're different in a way that makes somebody want to say, yes, uh, you've led me to this place. Where do I sign up? Or, you know, how do I, you know, how do I engage you to get the result you're talking about now? And, and so I think that, uh, I think there's a whole lot of people running those kind of low cost funnels thinking they'll warm people up. Well, all they're really doing is turning their ideal client away. Yeah. I, you know, there's, um, it, it's, it's really important, I think, to understand just what are the metrics that really count. Right. Um, there's a there's a, another YouTube channel that I that I follow, and uh, the owner of the channel uh, gave a talk uh, a few weeks ago where he was talking about how he was going to be changing the channel because what he determined was that the videos that were informative videos that actually led people to reach out and create a sales contact, which led to yes. acquiring clients for his business were not necessarily the same videos that got the most views, comments, et cetera. And when they started to sit down and talk with their customers about what, what influences brought them in, they realized, you know, if we're making stuff because we're chasing likes and views that and works. new subscribers, we may not actually be creating the content that is really what brings paying customers through the door. And I, and I find that some people can get hung up on some of these vanity metrics that are created on the internet, looking at certain numbers. And, you know, I, I, it's easy to get caught up in this because it happens to me too, where I'll get excited, you know, oh, I just hit it, you know, another milestone with subscribers yeah. or something. Yeah. But, but that's not what makes somebody call me up and say, I want to work with you. Right. It's, right. it's some bit of information where I've shown them that I can help them solve their problem. That's what makes them want to reach out. And so it, it, it's almost like these uh, these false sort of pathways are created that can be a very alluring to some people. Well, and I think it all starts with, I think you use the word objectives. You know, that's that's where people, I think, get really lost. They're like, oh, I need to do what these people are doing. Well, those people are not trying to do the same thing you're, you're trying to do. I mean, I work with a lot of startup agencies and, and consultants, and really their first year working with six or eight clients, the way that we teach them to work would, would be a lot. I mean, that would be a full book of business for a lot of them. So why are they trying to run funnels to get thousands of subscribers to get right? They just need to have about 16 great conversations <laughs> with the right 16 people and they will get their six to eight clients. Um, and so I think that that's where people really, um, you know, they look at the easy button. They look at social media to get uh, in front of a lot of folks, but they're not having deep conversations to build relationships, to help people understand, you know, what they do that's that's completely unique and different and, and how I can solve your problem. You mentioned talking to your clients. I mean, that is part of one of the keys to our strategy first uh, approach when we work with a client is we talk to their clients um, and we find out quite often more about their business than than the owner of the business uh, knows. And that's really the direction we take them to is like, then you need to start talking about these things that your actual clients are saying that you solve for them and stop, you know, stop talking about all the stuff everybody else is talking about. Can you, you mentioned that, you know, the average person that starts off uh, with a marketing business licensing your system might work with six people in their first year. Can you kind of take us through what would be a common evolution sort of pathway for one of those new uh, marketing firms? Well, so the, the very first thing, you know, so if somebody's just starting, I mean, you know, they've, they've got, they, let's say they jumped out of corporate. Well, you know, they got to learn first that nobody else is going to take the trash out. There is no IT department, right? I mean, so there's, you know, they've got to do a lot of really basic housekeeping stuff, right? They've got to set up bank accounts, get the right structure. So we actually help Are, them. Are former corporate marketing people one of the key groups of people that often it, do that? It, it is. It is a good, for, for the startup folks, I mean, our, you know, probably our probably our core, you know, is that agency that's what we call scaling sideways. You know, they're adding people and they're adding accounts, but they're not making any more money and they're working harder and, <laughs> and making less because they're selling tactics. So those folks that have already figured out how to get a client or two and do have some marketing experience, we show them how to raise their prices and have a, you know, 
a much better uh, onboarding, a much better delivery process. And so they in, in instantly become much more profitable. I mean, those folks, let's face it. I mean, they, they, in many cases in, within 30 days, they're, <clears throat> you know, they're, thrilled you know with with the changes they've been able to make to their uh, agency but we have probably a third of the folks that we've trained over the years are, are people coming out of uh, corporate that uh, they have good marketing background they want to work with small business owners but they also want to they, they want the fastest path to get there they want a shortcut you know they, they want to take uh, our tools and processes and just kind of hit the ground running oh well you know I can't believe I mentioned vanity metrics without asking people to hit the like button because <laughs> that, that really does help the YouTube algorithm or any other platform that you're watching on. So please, if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the thumbs up that that helps us out tremendously. So so you mentioned there the growing sideways thing. I think that's really interesting because um, it's it's something that that I've seen quite often, too, is where people again, maybe this has to do with with a different kind of vanity metric. People will often chase revenue. Right. And it doesn't translate into more profits. Yeah. And, or, and, or I, I, the other one I'll just throw out, sorry to interrupt. The other one I'll throw out is like headcount is another great yeah. one for agencies. Right. <laughs> I, I've also seen number of offices, yeah, you know, sure. it, it, you know, <laughs> how many offices we have, which cities that were represented right. in that kind of thing too. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating, but it, it does relate to this idea that people have somewhere deep seated in their mind about what, indicators kind of uh, mean that they've made it? Yeah. I mean, we have some solopreneurs uh, in our, you know, in our network that are ma making more, I should say, taking home more <laughs> uh, money than some 15, 20 person agencies, um, yeah. you know, without the, the same overhead and headaches. Yeah. And, wow. and it's partly because you can <laughs> today. <laughs> and, and so most of the, the licensees in your network, are they working with people that are close at hand uh, in the field or are they working with people all over in a, in a virtual kind of way? I would say most are working with people all over in a virtual way. Uh, again, because it's, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that was kind of odd. Um, uh, but, you know, today, you know, even if I have a client or so one of our consultants has a, a client in their community, they're probably still not going to their offices <laughs> that often. Um, yeah. And so that's that's just kind of become the way that uh, people enjoy working. And it's certainly opened up a, a talent pool, you know, to us as uh, to, you know, to find providers, you know, all over the world and, and, you know, for very different specific things, you know, sometimes you get a client that needs, um, needs a, you know, direct mail campaign, for example, then, you know, that's not something you do every day. Well, you can find the best of class, you know, company to actually run that A to Z, uh, for you. And, and when you're done with that project, you're done with that company. Um, and I think that that, you know, that type of mentality of orchestrating what needs to be done, um, has, has really, you know, made it, um, possible for people to do that. Now, the key, though, of course, uh, that, that we have to do a lot of preaching is, you know, most of the marketing folks I run across are undercharging. <laughs> they're not charging enough for their services. They feel like, oh, I can't get it. And it's because they're selling tactics that somebody down the road will sell for half of <laughs> what they're selling it for. And so they're constantly fighting that price pressure, you know, that's a race to the bottom. So, you know, by leading with strategy, uh, for example, you know, you become the trusted advisor instead of the vendor. And, and, you know, in many cases, you're going to recommend the exact same things, but now you're at a whole different level of relationship with the client. Yeah. Uh, no, it makes, it makes perfect sense to me. What, um, <clears throat> you know, we talked about how <clears throat> things haven't really changed as far as understanding what, who are the customers? What's our goal? What are we trying to do with this marketing? We mentioned how the, the, the methods or the modes or the media keep changing. Right. Um, do you think it's possible for some of these media or, or mechanisms to start affecting uh, the journey? Like, do you, do you, one of the things that, uh, that I learned back in the yellow pages days is that consumer behavior was set at certain key points in a person's That's life. Right. Yeah. And that certain key events in a person's life were drivers of yellow page usage. So they were like gra graduation from high school, marriage, home ownership, and baby coming along, right? Those were like key ones sure. that would drive someone to be consuming a lot more stuff because right. all the changes in their life. And so I'm wondering, you know, obviously a young person today isn't, isn't learning the behavior of reaching for that phone book anymore that I, I've 
spoken with an amazing number of business people who still get tremendous value from the yellow pages because they happen to market to a much older demographic who are still mm. using it. Yeah. But I'm just wondering those those media and things, they're obviously having an impact on how people behave as consumers. What what changes do you see happening right now that that you can see going off into the future here? Well, I, th I think the real challenge, you know, you start talking about the yellow pages, it, you know, once somebody reached for the yellow pages, there was a high intent, <laughs> uh, yes. you know, for what they were going to do. And so, as you said, you know, the ads basically said open 24 hours, emergency service, you know, the, yeah. the kind of high intent stuff. Well, now the problem is um, people are turning to, you know, eight different channels <laughs> uh, with the same high intent. Um, and so, you know, that, that that offers a real challenge for a lot of businesses because you know it really forces us to in a lot of ways be everywhere um, but when i guide or you know advise businesses it's not really so much about being everywhere because let's face it you you can't do it in a lot of cases you won't do it well <laughs> in a lot of cases you'll spread yourself thin but what what you have to, I think, uh, do is you have to have the modes of communication, the unified communication. So if somebody has high intent and they go to your Google business page and want to leave a message, you've got to be able to reply to that. Mm -hmm. If they go to your website and they want to have that little chat widget, <laughs> you know, you've got to have, you know, a response to that. Um, you have to use text uh, today in many, many um demographics in many, many industries as a way to communicate appointment times, as a way to schedule appointment times. I mean, so you really convenience of communication is probably the, you know, the replacement, I guess, for the fact that somebody had high intent and went to, you know, the yellow book. It, it's, it's interesting because I, I don't think I've really thought about this, but, you know, if you know, if somebody was back back in the '90s. You know, someone put a certain kind of ad in the yellow pages, a different kind of ad in the newspaper, but sure. people weren't messaging back through the newspaper. Right. They had to pick up the phone. Everything ended, ended up on the phone, right? That's right? So they had that one one uh, main communication mode, and now you've got you know different ads on different platforms, and they all are able to conduct messages. And if you've got one that's not being covered, then all of a sudden you're though all the value that you potentially could be deriving from that channel could be lost. Yeah. And there's some technology out there we use. Um, we actually built a, a tool we call duct tape engine uh, that is essentially a tool that unifies communication. Uh, so, you know, Facebook message, Instagram message, Google message, uh, chat widget, <laughs> um, after hours message, you know, on the phone that we missed, those all come into one uh, dashboard so that people can, because what we found is, people were just not turning some things on because they're like, we can't respond. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't even know how to do that. And, and so we've spent a lot of uh, time and effort on uh, developing a platform to, to bring all that together. Cause that's, that's really the secret. If you turn all that on and don't reply, um, then you're probably yeah. actually making it worse. Yeah. That, so just like anyone who's tried to message me through my business Facebook page would know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I went in there the other day and there were like four messages. <laughs> um, so, uh, so John, uh, for people that are interested in either working with you as a small business owner or people who <laughs> are into marketing who might want to explore the idea of, of licensing your systems, uh, what would be the best way for them to reach out and connect with you? Sure. The easiest way is just <clears throat> ducttapemarketing.com. And that's D-U-C-T-T-A-P-E marketing.com. We do, I do training webinars. You know, if you go to the website, there'll be a little pop-up that invites you to one January 24th. Um, there's certainly, you know, lot, lots of links there on, you know, how to find out, uh, you know, deeply about uh, licensing our system. Obviously, if you, you know, one of the best ways is to uh, to jump on, you know, with a team member and, and just kind of chat about your specific situation, which, you know, all of those options will be available once you visit the site. Okay. And just one final question. Uh, when you named the firm, did you have to license anything from MacGyver? <laughs> no, but I do get lots of people ask about that. Like, how did you get to use that name? Well, the uh, the <laughs> D U C T T A T A P E is a generic term for it would be like electrical tape or masking yeah. tape, right? It's not licensed to or trademarked by anyone, and never will be uh, because of its its ubiquitous use. Um, but there there are some brands, you know, Duck 
D-U-C-K uh, tape uh, uh, brand from Manco is, you know, is certainly probably the most known uh, close to it uh, brand. Uh, I, I actually bought D-U-C-K tape marketing because a lot of people refer to, uh, to my firm as D-U-C-K and it, and it just, uh, it actually just redirects you uh, to yeah. the right place. <laughs> but uh, I was seeing it happen so often. I was like, I better buy that URL too. Well, that's awesome. Uh, John, thanks so much for joining us today. I, I thought it was great. Um, you're the first person I've spoken to who is, you know, uh, has licensed intellectual property in this way to, to a wide variety of people, um, maybe with a couple of exceptions. But um, and so it was great to have you on here to talk about it today. And, um, and thank you very much. Yeah, well, my pleasure. I invite any anybody to reach out. You can even send me an email. It's just john at ducttapemarketing.com as well. Awesome. And uh, we're going to exit today with a, with a message from uh, my YouTube channel sponsor. We'll see you later. Special thanks go to today's video sponsor, Mark Willis of Lake Growth Financial. Mark helps people better manage their personal wealth and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've gotten lots of positive feedback from people I've worked with over the years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find a playlist of all the interviews I've done with Mark and to learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up to arrange a conversation about what this solution might look like for you. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site at davidcbarnett.com. You'll find hundreds of articles and videos all for free. You'll find links to my books and online courses, and you can sign up for my email list and get emails covering topics that interest you and be notified of new videos. This episode of Small Business and Deal Making is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice ideas and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. And if you've discovered us today via the network, then I hope you're enjoying the show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss any one of our great episodes.